I don't mean to offend you by saying this, but I think many of the people who played and loved the first Borderlands uh -huh. uh, experienced it as quite a surprise. I mean, the, the expectations for it, uh, if you had asked many players a half year before it came out, yes. were not that big. So, so what happened? What happened? <laughs> um, well, I, I can understand why people didn't have, like, they were taken by surprise. Uh, it was a big risk. It was very different. A uh, role-playing shooter was not something people had heard of, really. The, the art style was bizarre to a lot of people. The gameplay style, that role-playing shooter, that mix, that hybrid, the way it was, was different from the other role-playing games out there. You've seen shooters and you've seen role-playing games from the first person's perspective, but having a shooter of role-playing elements blended the way it is, that was unique. Um, the, uh, what do you call it, the character of it, the humor, all the, the weird things, everything about the game was different. Um, so there wasn't a lot of, like, well, I've seen a game that's just like that, and I know that sold a lot. I know that did really well. There were no comparisons for Borderlands. Um, so it's not surprising. You know, heck, we were all really nervous ourselves at Gearbox about how is this going to do? How are people going to receive it? Um, and we were blown away. I mean, that's a, a lot of people played Borderlands, and it really, you know, it motivated us to be even more aggressive and, and more, you know, uh, just... I don't know, ambitious with mm. Borderlands 2. Yeah. I mean, this is a three-year sequel. Yeah. This is not your typical one or two-year kind of turnaround, like, oh, here's the same game with a couple of new environments. Like, we went really ambitious with Borderlands 2 as well. Yeah. And also, uh, I, I guess one of the things that, that, again, surprised a lot of people were that, that uh, other developers had previously tried to do the what's popularly known as uh, the dungeon crawler on the consoles, and no one had really succeeded. Mm -hmm. and, and out of nowhere, with little experience in doing role-playing games, sure. uh, you guys just more or less nailed it. Yeah, uh, it was, I, I think sometimes it, it feels like maybe that formula is like, yeah, anybody can get that formula, but I guess sometimes it's just, the, it's the right time, right place in a lot of ways, you know? Like the, the, I think a big part of it was the combination of the, not only was it that core loot loop, like a lot of people can get, you know, get that, doing it well, um, but the procedural weapon generation system that was a system that was unique to Borderlands that nobody else had. And the style and tone of the game mm. mixed those together, yeah. I think, is what really made it distinct. Um, certainly people tried dungeon crawlers, yeah. Um, but I think nobody had the, the weapon system that Ge Gearbox had, and nobody had the style and tone that Gearbox had. So I think that's what really hit and what made it special. Um, and we feel freaking lucky that it did as well as it did, yeah. though. I mean, that. You do not expect a game to sell four or five million copies no. as a new IP, no. taking the, sticking their neck out as big as we did with Borderlands. Yeah. So, and also I, I think it, it showed in in the DLC that was released for Borderlands that mm -hmm. that your con uh, confidence in, in your own skills and and as a whole was was constantly going up. So is that something you have been able to apply to the sequel? Oh yeah, uh, Borderlands Two is very ambitious. Uh, you yeah, as you mentioned in the DLCs, you started to see like. The way simple systems like, say, the NPCs in Borderlands proper, NPCs were not animated, and it was little pop-up dialogues. And, and then the DLC, you started to see some rudimentary animations, a little bit happening there, and the uh, dialogue got a little more you know, integrated to it in the ecosystem. And in Borderlands 2, you're going to see fully integrated NPCs giving you missions that dynamically change. Um, the ecosystem and the communication and the mission system is entirely different you'll be able to have missions that change dynamically throughout your, throughout your game of Borderlands 2. And those missions affect the world as, as you know it. And you get to make decisions on how and where you turn in your missions and where you get new missions at. Like, everything's way, way bigger and way more. It's that sense of adventure you're gonna get in Borderlands 2 that we, um, we weren't able to do quite as much in Borderlands 1, but this time around, it's, you're going to feel like it's not so much a fetch and return kind of thing. It's a, well, as you just played up over there, exactly. like Mordecai gives you a mission, you're going on your way to do one thing. This changes, but you don't have to go check it in. You just keep going, and as it changes, it changes again. You do more things, and it's, you know. Yeah, and, and also, uh, I noticed that, that uh, actually on the, the Mordecai Mer uh, mission, I got another mission, just mm -hmm. uh, like on the go mission. And, yeah. and to me, one of the few problems with the first game was, as you said, that, that, that you know, got a mission, you got it, complete it, and you go back. Or yeah. you just line up like tens of missions, yeah, got yeah. complete them, and go back. But it's a very, like, uh, slowly paced way to build up the game. Yeah. Uh, and that certainly seems to be fixed in the sequel. 
Yeah, that was a, um, a, a big goal for Borderlands 2 was for people to spend less time just backtracking for the sake of, well, the freaking mission system requires it. Um, we want people to always feel like that sense of progress and growth and make you know, decisions that are all about just adventure and not so much like, well, I'll do this because it's closer for that long ass hike back, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, also, in the first Borderlands, it seemed that, that while it was, of course, tuned for, for co-op play and it was great in co-op play, mm -hmm. most of the characters themselves really didn't interact as well with the others. Like, for instance, if you take an MMO like World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. you have the tank, you have the healers, and you sure. have everything. That wasn't really a big part, to me at least, in the first Borderlands, whereas um, I checked out some of the latest skills uh, oh, on the skills. The yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and it seems that, that for instance, the Gunserker has uh, mobility to, to act as the aggro guy mm -hmm. and uh, the Siren can uh, kind of c crowd control. Is, is that yep. something that, that you focused on in the sequel? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, um, the role-playing elements of Borderlands 2 are uh, greatly enhanced, I guess as you can call it. I don't know what the right word is for it, but essentially um, we wanted to reward people who were playing together more and we wanted them to feel more options and choices to, to affect their teammates. So the Siren, for example, yeah, she can do crowd control, but she can also do it like a healer class, mm. where she can use that phase lock and actually res somebody from across the map, you know, like, and all these different things that people can do. Um, yeah, the Gunzerker has all those aggro skills, and uh, there's a lot of different things where they can, you know, do different things to affect the enemies. Um, I mean, heck, the, the phase lock can pick up anybody in the battlefield. So if the gun zerker is getting close, he can you can phase lock a boss right next to him, and then he can pull back out and be safe. Like, yep. yeah, the, all the skill trees you see on all the character classes, very much. Yeah, they thought more about this and how the character classes can interact with each other. Also, uh, the first thing I'm, I'm all this heard said about Borderlands 2 was that it was going to be much more varied in uh, in both levels and and the way that the the levels sprawled in design and mm -hmm. and also the enemies, and that clearly shows. Um, uh, the, the first part of Lines was really um, um, uh, original visually, but it, it seems. But yeah. it seems like you you said it yourself, <laughs> yeah. and a lot of brown colors. Whereas yes. this is just much much more colored. Yeah, um, that was a, a big goal for the art team. Was um, now that the, we have a full dev cycle with this art style, um, you have much more room to explore and time to explore. And you know when you do a project for three years, that's a lot of time to do a lot of art. So um, you'll see. Um, you know, the, if, actually, if you saw our, our Gamescom demonstration, we were doing this, you know, ice, snowy tundra stuff, and some of this hot spring stuff. Then we did a dam top at Gamescom. Um, here, you're seeing these grasslands inspired by like Iceland and, and those, those you know, rolling hills. You're seeing caustic caverns, which are just like these caves that say um, it's covered in you know caustic slime. You know, basically, like you're seeing all the colors of the rainbow, and there's far more that you guys will see and coming up hopefully really soon but, but was that something that you feared before you 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 made the decision because i remember when uh, when the first words were said about diablo a lot of fans said well yeah well it's not dark enough we want our oh, yeah, dark hellish that. blah 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 oh. whereas this is is of course not the game but it's also a game that that really embraces colors and and mm -hmm. very uh, different design yeah um that was a one of the big challenges that the art team took on was the 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 goal of being a little more colorful but also still feeling um, dangerous, you know. Um, the art style kind of really helps make that happen because you can experiment a lot with, you know, like the hatching and all the little bits and pieces of how the textures are designed. It's all hand painted. Mm. Um, the other side of that, though, is that when you do a, a more diverse color set, it's actually uh, much more difficult because you can't say for a desert you could have this texture here and this texture in this next level is where just slightly different whereas there's no crossover of these texture sets when it comes to different areas now because it's so diverse so mm. it was very very ambitious of these guys and I feel, I feel like they pulled it off great. So so if you had to pinpoint one thing about mm. Borderlands 2 that, that you clearly feel makes it a lot better than the first game what would it be? One thing? Yeah one thing I'm, I'm kind of... Really? Lost. Just the one? Okay, two then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you know what? I, I'm going to go with the um, how the weapons feel this time around. Um, last time around, we had millions of weapons, and a lot of them could tend to look kind of similar to each other. Um, this time around, uh, this is an entirely new weapon system. You're going to see every time I get a gun, when I see it, 
I'm almost certain I know how it's going to act and what it's going to do because of all the additional visual characteristics these things now have. Like, I can see a gun on the ground and actually say, like, man, that's a, you know, a fire-breathing shotgun with a auto-loader, and, like, I can identify all these things now in these weapons, and I, I love that in that core system, I'm now able to quickly identify and, like, that gun's awesome, I'm going to beat that other guy to it. Like, I love that system, and that's the core of the whole game is that gun system, you know? Um, this is, and, and it's not to put you in the spot or anything, but, but this is kind of the year for dungeon crawlers. We have Diablo 3. I cannot wait. Yes. <laughs> we have, uh, we have uh, Torchlight 2. I cannot wait. <laughs> and we have Borderlands now, Borderlands yeah. 2. Um, yeah. Is there anything that, 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 besides, of course, the first person view, that, that you think makes Borderlands a different kind of experience than, than the other two games? Um, well, I've played the Diablo beta. Um, I, I love that. I um, have not played the Torchlight beta. I don't know if there is one, actually. No, I don't think so. Should, um, if, if, send one. Yeah, if, if both <laughs> of us, please. Yeah. please. Um, besides the first person perspective, I think um, my guess would be the, the uh, more orientation on the action side of, of the games. Like, um, we are a role playing shooter, whereas those things are more like. Um, there's more muddling around in skill trees and less action and blowing yeah. things up, you know? Whereas this is, in Borderlands 2, you can spend your time just blowing things up, you know? And you can fuss with the skill trees a little bit and you can still get by without doing it. Um, the role playing side of Borderlands 2, um, it can get very deep and rich, but you also are not, um, I guess, pinned to it, you know? Like you can just, I want to be a guy who blows things up and you choose that one tree and you don't have to think about it. You know, it's, it's, it's to be explored as much as you want to explore it, whereas you're, you're hitched to you have to make the right decision on your, on your skill trees on some of those other games. Is that something you feel is important when, when also going for the console crowd? Well, not being, you know, too, you know, no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I was like, uh, no, not really. Okay. I think it's just the, the differences in our approaches is all. Um, and it's a different kind of audience who plays the games differently. You know, it's... Really, it's you know top-down view versus first-person shooter view. So it's kind of a lot of the different guys anyway. You know. All right. Thanks a lot. We're gonna need a lot of guns.